So uh, welcome. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the virtual cocktail half an hour. Um, you know, Andrew from Loft Orbital, Molly from NASA, and I started this meetup with the goal of bringing together the software and aerospace industries. And hopefully these events uh, bring us one step closer to that. So uh, during the talk, feel free to write comments and questions in the chat, and uh, the speakers will try to address that in either real time or at the end in a Q&A session. Um, and so now it's my pleasure to introduce Kai Stats and Ezio uh, Moledi uh, to the talk about Simic, which is their high fidelity model and interface that simulates a human habitat on Mars. So Kai is a veteran software engineer working on all kinds of platforms for science research and education. He co-founded the Yellow Dog Linux operating system, has worked on machine learning algorithms that have been used by LIGO to detect supernova, and is currently the project lead of CMOC. Uh, and Ezio is a software engineer on the team with over 20 years of experience and is a C Python core developer, Python something that you guys probably use every day, so thank him. And he's also an avid photographer. So without any further ado, Kai, please take it away. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, hope this, I, I, I think we've heard this a hundred times, but I think it's important to say that I hope this finds everyone healthy uh, in such uh, strange times. And I really appreciate your making time this evening to, to join us in this virtual environment. It'll be fun someday maybe to give the talk again or an update talk in person. Uh, when it's a little bit uh, more comfortable for all of us to come together. So thanks again for joining. Um, I want to clarify one thing. I don't call myself a software engineer. I'm more of an architect. I come up with ideas. I am a programmer, but compared to the guys I work with, like Ezio and Yuri and some of my former team members at Yellow Dog Linux, um, I'm, I'm just the guy who has the ideas and, and helps pay the bills. And it's folks like Ezio who really make it happen. Um, so I'm happy that Ezio was able to join us this evening. Uh, Yuri was not available. Um, but uh, as you and I are going to share this, this presentation. So I have a lot of stuff to cover, and I'm going to jump into the slide deck here pretty soon. We're going to go pretty fast, but at least you won't be bored, and hopefully you won't fall asleep. And uh, we're going to go right up to the demo, a uh, live demo of CMOC, and then I'm going to hand it over to Ezio, and he's going to describe um, some of the software components, and then we'll be open to a question and answer period. And if we have time at the very, very end, there's just a brief couple of slides I'd like to share with you about a, a really cool project that comes next. So here we go. The, the title of the talk is Becoming Interplanetary, and it's an exploration of long-term off-world habitation with CMOC. And the emphasis is on long-term, as you'll see when we get into the talk. And as I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking, well, is this a talk about space with computer geeks, or is this a talk about computers with space geeks? And maybe it's a little bit of both. Um, and I'm okay with that. I think we're going to kind of touch base on, on everything. And uh, hopefully we, we appeal to, uh, to all of you out here who might be in both categories or one or the other category. When we think about long-term habitation of off-world environments like the moon or Mars or Europa or Enceladus or asteroids, we often see beautiful artwork like this. This is done by a friend of mine named Brian Vierstig, um, who is a phenomenal space architect. And we look, at these, we look at these images and we look at these, these sealed habitats and they look like something we could build today. And it's true, we could. But there's a lot of things missing in these artistic renderings about how we actually are going to survive in these environments. The harsh conditions are often not talked about in both science fiction and even in reality. It's been told to me by a gentleman at NASA, uh, Johnson Space Center, that NASA does not know how to, to provide a fresh salad to an astronaut every week, either on orbit or on a, on a terrestrial environment. And that seems like a harsh statement, but I think there's some truth to that. And that's a lot of what motivated and started this entire project of started CMOC was how do we simulate the complexities in, required to sustain human life for long periods of time in these harsh environments. So we look to science fiction, uh, Star Trek is one of my favorites, and we have airlocks that never need decompression. We have transporters that instantly move objects from point A to point wherever, and we have food that can be ordered on demand. Don't worry about the greenhouse, don't worry about the you know, edible and inedible biomass and all the things that go with it. And of course we have potatoes that are raised out of human feces, uh, which doesn't really work all that well. So we have these, these 
environments that we've seen on film, we've read about them in books, and we get excited about them, but there's a lot of things that get in the way. So we have to ask the question, how do we actually do this? And it comes down to one basic, well, there's a number of functions, but there's one basic thing we really have to be concerned about, which is environmental control and life support system. That's what keeps the humans alive. And there are two basic categories. There's physical, chemical, and no, that's not a mistype, that's not a typo. It really is the word physical. I don't know why. Um, it's air, water, and food, temperature, and atmospheric pressure, waste products managed by machines. And that's exactly what's on the International Space Station now. So this is a ground-based uh, a replica or a copy of what's on the International Space Station. This is what has kept astronauts alive for more than 20 years. And it's a very complicated machine and it breaks a lot and it's very expensive to fix when it's broken. We also have bioregenerative life support systems. And that means that we're working with a combination of higher plants and animals and microorganisms. We're really trying to reproduce the environment that we're accustomed to here on Earth in smaller systems with the least complexity possible. And that's the key. What is the minimum complexity required to keep a human being alive using plants and animals? So a brief history of space farming, which is really quite fascinating. Um, all the way back to 1971, the Soviets uh, were doing some really cool studies in their space station, working with flax and leeks and onions and cabbage. They ate the first veggies grown in space uh, four years later. But what's interesting is that it took about 10 or 12 years before we took seeds into orbit, grew the seeds into a living plant that produced seeds that produced another plant that we could eat. One full cycle took over a decade. Now, partially that's because we're in microgravity. Microgravity makes water do really weird things and plants don't quite know which way is up, literally. So there's a lot of challenges in that that will be reduced when we're on the moon or on Mars, but not completely eliminated. And of course, those, those experiments have continued. This is the uh, full extent of the uh, bioregeneration attempts on the space station. The long-term challenge, a long-term solution to off-world habitation is gonna be a combination of machines and bioregeneration, a hybrid solution. The closest thing we've come to, to that is Biosphere 2. Um, I just noticed I misspelled Biosphere. I need to fix that. Um, so <laughs> Biosphere 2 is about an hour and a half from where I live. I just live on the other side of those peaks, uh, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner. And this, this facility was built in the mid 80s and was functional with eight humans sealed inside from 1991 to 1994 or 92 through 94, it's the world's largest completely sealed experiment in long-term human habitation. There are a number of existing, um, or I should say current scientific and research projects, and they're only growing. They're doing some phenomenal work with their ocean, with the rainforest, with the desert biome. Uh, the tour is absolutely fantastic. And as I'll tell you a little bit later, I had a chance to live there for a month uh, last year and conduct my own experiment. This is called Lunar Palace. This is the most recent attempt at a fully sealed bioregenerative environment. This was uh, 2017 to 2019, three or four different runs for as long as eight months with four astronauts inside. This is China's uh, project. And this is really cool. This is kind of the opposite of Biosphere 2. Instead of these huge environments, they compacted everything into a very small space, computer controlled, computer articulated, monitored. Um, this is much closer to what we're probably going to see in first, second, and third generation human habitation on the moon, Mars, even in orbit, right? So this is something we would kind of expect. Now, the challenge behind this, of course, is that when these guys moved in, all the plants were already in place. They were already grown, already mature, already fully functional. And that presents another challenge, which is how do you build something like this and get it operational with robots? Or do humans come in with seeds in their pockets and literally start with bare soil, in which case you're fully reliant on machines until the plants are mature? So this is something that came out of the Lunar Palace. Uh, this is their systems flow. They had a number of these diagrams. This is my favorite. And as you can see, it covers a lot from storage to crew to condensate treatment um, to reclaim water, urine treatment, solid waste treatment. But here's the best part right here, the yellow mealworm. So the yellow mealworm is a way of taking inedible biomass, the stuff that we don't eat, the stalks, the leaves, the shells, the seed pods, the stuff that we simply can't digest. And the yellow mealworm is able to take that inedible biomass and convert it to a fully digestible protein if you don't mind eating worms. 
So this comes down to a sometimes cultural differences. There are some cultures that are more comfortable with these things than others. Um, there are other types of uh, organic materials and, and I should say plants and animals that also perform some similar functions. Mushrooms are one of them. Mushrooms or fungi are excellent at breaking things down uh, and of course are highly edible. There's also set larger animals such as chickens and goats um, that are also exceptional at, uh, at converting this inedible biomass and, and sometimes waste material into something that we can safely digest. So that takes us to CMOC. And CMOC is a scalable interactive model of an off-road community. This was originally a pilot project for the Arizona State University Interplanetary Initiative. We had funding from 2017 through 2019. And it was through this project uh, started originally as a five person capstone team, an undergraduate team that did, built the first model. And Ezio and Yuri uh, have been part of phase three and uh, really, really helped just convert this into or take this into its current state, uh, rebuilding the entire system from the ground up. So for those of you who are uh, interested in mathematical models or in programming systems, I want to be clear that this is an agent-based model. What does that mean? It means that instead of having a uh, discrete formula, in which we're simply using a spreadsheet or even a Python uh, program, and we've, we've predefined the interactions between each ones of the components of the model. Instead, we're defining each agent as having inputs and outputs. So if I'm a human agent, I take oxygen in, water in, food in, I give off carbon dioxide, I give off waste water, and I give off waste solids. And that then there's something else in the system that takes those in. So the plants take in carbon dioxide, give off oxygen, take in the wastewater, and again, the mealworms might be the things that take in the waste product, the, the solid waste. So in that agent-based model, we've defined each one of the agents, and then we set the model in motion, and those agents interact on a simulated hour-to-hour -hour basis, 24 hours a day. So what, the reason we do that is because we get complex behavior out of relatively simple mathematical functions. So where we might have just linear functions, something plus something, we end up with nonlinear behavior, things that can go a little bit chaotic, which is exactly what we shot for and exactly what we got as I demonstrate later. So this gives you an idea of some of the agents and some of the what we call currencies of exchange, those things that move between the agents. This is the CMOC interaction diagram. I built this in 2017, and this is uh, the original Diagram we started with, created by a gentleman named Raymond Wheeler at NASA Kennedy. He spent his, his career focused on uh, really modeling and understanding these human-in-the-loop closed ecosystems. And a lot of the data that we use in CMOC comes from his research. He's prolific. Uh, just look up Raymond Wheeler if you want to learn more. These are the categories of agents, uh, inhabitants, ECLIS, agriculture, ISRU, and then these are all the agents that we've defined. And this gives you a little bit better feeling as you zoom in. Now, not all of these are active right now. This is our ultimate goal is to have all these active. You can see that we've defined such things as a clinic and a rec center and a studio and theater, a sanctuary, a kitchen, uh, surveyors, excavators, transporters and processors, a wide variety of things that would help us. At least we're trying to simulate a very, very complex environment. We have about a dozen of these currently active in the model and we're able to expand now that the model is built. So here's an example of the human agent, I was, the human inhabitant agent I was talking about earlier. This gives you the actual uh, amount of exchange of oxygen and water and food, carbon dioxide, urine and waste and heat. Um, and these are these numbers all come out of a document called the NASA uh, BVAD, um, which is the baseline values and assumptions document. And then there's an integral component called Human Integration Design Handbook that fed data into that BVAD. So this is also something that's available on Google Scholar. Um, or on the CMOC website, we have all this available. This is just one example of over 30 different agents. Uh, we have about a 3,000 line JSON file that defines interactions between each one of them. So this is the part of the talk where I wish we were in person because I, I like to walk into a, a, a theater with a grocery bag and I hand out these very items. Uh, for the wheat, of course, I hand out a loaf of bread. And I just hand them out at the beginning of the talk and I don't really explain why and then once we get to a little bit later in the talk, we start looking at the actual values. Now, I know this text is really small, so lean into your computer a bit. These are all of the plants that we currently have in CMOC. These are actually in the model, again, from Ray Wheeler at NASA. And you can see that this is a really, really finely tuned 
um, understanding of how these plants grow. Rice, wheat, cabbage, chad, celery, or chard, celery. And we're looking at their growth rate on average of grams per hour. And then when, they, when they're finished growing for the total number of days, which is the growth period, we have the total amount of mass and then the amount of edible and inedible biomass. And we've been tracking nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, potable water, atmospheric oxygen, atmospheric CO2. All of this is in the model. So then we zoom in a little bit and we say, well, if you're going to go to the moon or to Mars, what would you bring with you? And this really harkens back to the biosphere too. We learned a lot in the biosphere too. It was not, as some of you might have heard, a failure by any means. It was an incredible excuse me, an incredible learning experience. So let's look at the oxygen, the oxygen production of cabbage versus a strawberry versus wheat. We'll check that out. The, the wheat is far, far greater by a huge factor above, um, in fact, almost 10 times more than the cabbage. So if you want something that's going to take in a lot of CO2 and produce a lot of oxygen, you want wheat. However, if you've ever grown cabbage or grown wheat, you know that cabbage you can eat as soon as it's ready and it grows quite a bit faster than wheat, whereas wheat takes a long time to grow, and then you have to harvest it, and then you have to process it. So in the biosphere, they say it took seven months to make their first pizza. There's also sweet potatoes, tomatoes, and green onions. Now look at wheat and look at sweet potatoes. Both of them are incredible producers of oxygen and CO2. It turns out that in the biosphere, they ended up planting sweet potatoes everywhere, in the rainforest, in the desert, in the savanna. And they ate so many sweet potatoes that their skin turned orange um, over time. And the reason is because the sweet potato can be eaten right out of the ground. It has calories, it has a sweet flavor to it, and it's immediately processable into a number of different uh, foods. So briefly, I'm gonna share with you, this is an experiment that I ran in 2019. I was there living at the biosphere for a month. We actually grew our own barley fodder and we wanted to grow the barley in order to understand biomass accumulation, CO2, photosynthetic activating radiation, temperature, and humidity. Those are the five things that we monitored. Oh, also water, uh, water intake. The reason we did this is because if we go back to the data from Ray, these are averages. He took the beginning biomass of the weight of the seed and the end biomass, and all these numbers are averaged over the life of the plant. But that's not how plants grow. They don't grow in straight lines. If for any of you have gardened, you know that you go outside every day and you look and look and look and look and there's still nothing growing. And then suddenly the next day, it's two inches tall. The next day, it's six inches tall. That's a sigmoid function. That's a slow, fast, slow function. We want to capture that sigmoid function for ourselves and then reapply that sigmoid function in the Python code in order to take Ray's data, still end up at the same place, still end up with the total biomass, but do it over the course of not a linear function, but a sigmoid function. So this is the real data that was acquired in just the biomass, the other data are different plots. And this is, again, our application of a synthetic function to match that relative curve. Okay, CMOC demonstration. So first I wanna invite you to uh, the CMOC website, cmoc.space, it's a rich, deep website, old school website, lots of drop down menus because there's just way too much to put on a one page slider. Um, there's a page for first time users, for advanced users, which you guys would probably want to jump into. There's a one video tutorial, we're going to be doing a lot more. Um, for those of you who might be educators, we have a full uh, next, gen, or next uh, generation science standards NGSS aligned uh, curriculum. It's a 65 page document for grades five through 14. Uh, we have our full research library. Every resource we use to build CMOC is available for free online. Uh, all of those from Google Scholar, of course, but then uh, taken and, and, and updated locally. And we also have a blog for just our updates, public publications and lectures and such. We've been working with Nat Geo for over a year and a half, and they have uh, been patiently awaiting the launch of CMOC, which happened just one month ago today. We've partnered with National Geographic because they're all about education. They, they have a, a web portal called the National Geographic Education Resource Library. And on that portal, they have 4,000 applications of which we are proud to say that CMOC is now one of them. And so we encourage you to go uh, to their website and check it out, lots of cool stuff. So now we're gonna actually look at CMOC. So here we are at the uh, CMOC uh, site, and we're gonna go ahead and sign in. And I'm gonna go ahead and do a new configuration. Now I'm gonna choose a preset. We have four presets, one human, one human plus radish, four humans, four humans plus garden, 
And I'll exp I'm going to go through just two of them here, and then I'm going to hand over to Ezio so you can talk more about the software. And you'll see that in that preset, uh, we have Mars, we have a 10-day duration, very short mission, we have a small crew quarters, we have one inhabitant, 100 kilograms of food, which is plenty, one life support system, no greenhouse, we have uh, no plant species, we have a small solar array, and we have a battery. And over here on this side, we have a table of contents, which takes you through and, and talks to you about each one of these items over here. So if you want to learn more, more about the crew quarters, it's right there. If you want to learn more about the greenhouse, it's right there. And then on the graphs, which becomes more uh, relevant when we actually start introducing plants, this tells you about your solar production by your current solar array, and this is how your, um, how your power is being consumed. So here we go. We launch the simulation. And we're up and running. It's always good when a live demo actually works for a live presentation. So you can see that the simulation was instant, almost instantly generated, and I now have a scrubber uh, at the bottom. So in this simulation, I'm going to go ahead and let it play, and we'll speed it up a little bit. So you'll see that we have, um, this is the amount of power produced, the amount of power consumed. This is the amount of um, CO2 produced and the amount of CO2 consumed. And so what we're looking at here, these spikes are when the Eclipse rack, when the mechanical life support system turns on and activates. So we're going to go to consumption breakdown. And right here on the right-hand side is our, uh, this is basically the, the, the now point. This is what's happening right now. So you'll see that right now there's a CO2 removal agent activated. Now watch what happens as I step forward in time. As soon as we're past that point, it turns off. Now the CO2 agent is off. And so we'll go through and keep playing. And now it's back on. And now it's back off. And what is that doing? It's knocking the CO2 down below our nominal 0.1% CO2. On the right-hand side here, we have a lot of variables, which I won't go through all of them now. I'll let you do that later. But we track a lot. We track uh, all the different stages of water. We track the atmospherics. We track the food. And as you, you can see, as we go through the food, the human is indeed consuming food. We can download our simulation data, and you can store it locally. This is both for presets and your own uh, unique configuration. So if you come up with a really cool configuration, you can save it and share it with a friend. And CMOT can be run entirely offline. Once you've loaded the interface, you can load your data sets locally, share them with friends, share them with classmates, and run it that way. So I'm going to go to new simulation. And this time I'm going to go to one human and radish. Now at first it looks about the same, but I'm going to change this panel to greenhouse plant uh, configuration first. And you'll see that we have just a small number of radishes versus the total size of the greenhouse, just 40 square meters of radishes. Now we're going to change that to greenhouse plant growth. And you'll see the, the radishes are just barely starting to grow. But I want you to pay attention to this panel here, the CO2 production and consumption. So as at first it looks the same, right? We still see the CO2 being drawn down by the CO2 scrubber. However, we see additional power being used here. That's because we have grow lights. The grow lights are activated in a certain part of the day. Now watch these peaks. Watch right here. Over time, those peaks get smaller and smaller until they're activating just momentarily, and then eventually they're gone. So what happened? That means that the CO2 scrubber is no longer needed. And that's kind of cool. So now you'll see the CO2 scrubber is not coming on anymore. We have a urine processor coming on. We have some other things coming on, dehumidifier, but the CO2 scrubber is not. Why? Because the plant is actually doing the CO2 scrubbing for us. So now watch what happens as we get closer and closer to 100% growth. At 100% growth, we're going to harvest the radishes. Here we go. Boom. We harvest the radishes. They're pulled out of the garden. The plants are no longer there to take the CO2 out of the air. And we are now once again reliant on the CO2 scrubber. Pretty cool. I always get excited watching this, even though I've done it a hundred times. So now I'm going to go back one more time, and I'm going to go through this pretty quick because we could spend an entire uh, session on just this. I'm going to go to the four humans in a garden. And now when you come down, you'll see that we have wheat, cabbage, strawberries, radishes, red beets, and onions. We have many more solar panels from 30 to 400. We have two battery systems. And now we have a lot more power production. And we, this tells us how much of the greenhouse we're actually using. And it shows you we have wheat, we have cabbage, strawberries, radishes, beets, and onions. 
And I'm not going to launch a simulation because you guys can do on your own, experiment on your own, and you'll find something similar. But there's some surprises that I'd like for you to, to, to discover when you play with it as to what happens. It doesn't go quite as smooth as the previous ones. So even though this looks like this would be a good assembly, it's not the right balance. And that's the point of CMOC. The point is for you as citizen scientists, as scientists, for all of us as researchers, is to experiment with this incredibly complex environment to discover what is the balance that works long term. How do we maintain not only the right atmospherics, but how do we also maintain the right balance of water? How do we make certain we don't run out of water? And how do we make certain that we're actually putting edible food back into the system for the humans? And Ezio, your turn. Yes, so hello everyone. Uh, so as Kai mentioned, the CMOX server is an agent-based model and it's entirely written in Python. Uh, we are using uh, Flask, Redis, and uh, for the communication with the client, we are now using WebSockets. Uh, we also support uh, a different way of uh, using uh, CMOC. So right now it's only available on the National Geographic uh, um, website, as you saw, and is currently running on GCP. Uh, but it's also possible to run it locally on a laptop or on a local server. And, uh, and we are doing this, we are supporting this through Docker containers. So uh, if you run it locally, you can just uh, uh, run these uh, Docker containers and uh, you can run it on your laptop. But uh, if you want to uh, host it on a server and have like thousands of, of users uh, using it, uh, like we are doing on the National Geographic website, you can use GCP or uh, AWS or Azure. And uh, <coughs> the agents support different uh, functions, and uh, like you can have uh, normal, logarithmic, exponential, sigmoid, and even compound function, and each uh, with a uh, unique time scale. So some things happen uh, during like uh, day by day, other things um, are related to the whole lifetime of the agent. And um, we also have uh, a command line uh, interface. So if you just care about the data, uh, the number, uh, to process it late, later with some other tool, you can run it from the command line. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you want to uh, see the graphs or see the number or through a web browser, uh, you can use the web browser interface, which is the one that Kai just showed you. Um, so this was the back end. The front end, uh, for the front end, instead, we are using uh, uh, JavaScript uh, and we are using uh, Vue.js as a framework. Uh, we can use like uh, different themes. Uh, so right now, the focus is on Mars. So it only supports like simulation on Mars, but uh, it, it can be changed uh, depending on, on what you're using it for. Uh, I also show you that uh, we have uh, uh, four presets uh, right now plus a user-defined preset. So you can uh, create your own preset and uh, there is a, a, an interface where you can uh, quickly save it and load it as you uh, go through different iteration. Uh, but you can also uh, download presets uh, as <coughs> local file, excuse me, as local files uh, that you can then load again. So you can create like a lot of different presets uh, that you can load. And uh, uh, the dashboard is also customizable. Uh, you saw before, like Kai was uh, uh, switching the panels, like when he was showing you uh, the configuration of the greenhouse, for example, or um, you have like different graphs. So each of these panel uh, can be changed. Um, so you can decide what to show depending on what you're interested in. And uh, you can also add or remove panels. So it's completely uh, customizable. And you can also save uh, uh, like once you found you found a set of panels that works well for you, you can also save that. And uh, finally, the, the data, uh, the numbers that you actually uh, get from the server, so the server computes all the values and you get back all this data that you see through the charts uh, and graphs uh, and tables, uh, you can also download this data. And once you download it, you can use them again, even offline once you have CMOC running, so instead of uh, asking the server to calculate and send the data, once you calculate it once and save the file, you can load it again and you can go through the, using the same interface and the same panels. You can go through it again 
to observe and uh, see uh, finding patterns in the numbers and in the graphs uh, and in the charts. And um, as, as I mentioned, right now the focus is on Mars. So we are uh, simulating a Mars habitat, but the system itself uh, is flexible enough. The way it's designed, it makes it set, uh, flexible uh, enough that you can uh, use it for uh, a number of different applications. For example, from microbiology to even stock market trades, if you wanted to. So at this point, um, Ezio, is there anything else you would like to add? I know my, my slides on the on the software side of it was was relatively brief. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we move into the questions? No, I think it's fine. If they have any specific question, we can ask for one later. Okay, excellent. So Adam, if that's if that's good, we wanted to keep it short so we have lots of time for uh, for questions. We can always do additional demonstrations if people are interested. If we have time. Great. Well, thank you so much. I, th I thought that was absolutely fascinating. And uh, let's give them all a big round of uh, emoji reacts, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual uh, Yeah. And so then in, in, in terms of uh, questions, so it looks like we got a couple that I wrote down. And so as I'm asking these, please write more questions that you have. Um, again, a lot was covered. And so there's a lot to look into. So the first one is, is the software free? And I would add to that, is it open source? And if any one of us wants to contribute, um, how could we? Good questions, thank you. So coming from a, a Linux background, having spent 10 years running Terrasoft and developing Yellow Dog Linux, for those of you who might remember the uh, good old days of Linux on PowerPC, um, of course, we have a very strong foundation and belief in open source. We have not open sourced this yet. And, and part of the reason is that we're still in development. There, there's always a good time to, to open source once you have, really once you have your foundation in place. So that is our ultimate goal. We haven't set a time for that yet. Um, but it will be, once we open source it, of course, it will be free. And we haven't determined exactly what license we put that under. Um, in terms of contributions, yes, we would love to have some seasoned engineers and some newbies on board assisting in either JavaScript or Python um, or even server-side uh, management would be fantastic. So we would welcome, welcome that input. Great. Um, so another uh, question that came in, I'll ask this in terms of you mentioned looking into obtaining the right balance of parameters to ensure long-term survivability. And I'm what and uh, it looks like Anthony was wondering, have you ever looked at applying reinforcement learning to this environment? Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, within our team, we have we have a, quite a bit of background in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so we have talked about that. And it'd be a lot of fun to do reinforcement learning and to have uh, some kind of machine learning algorithm actually learn from the behavior of CMOC and then eventually take control of CMOC and and automate some of that that convergence onto the perfect balance of all of these different variables. That is something we'd like to do, and that's probably gonna be starting next year. We still have quite a bit of fidelity that we wanna bring into this model before we feel that it's, it's, it's good as it is, but there's a lot more we wanna do before we feel that it's ready or even worthwhile to bring the machine learning algorithms in. But absolutely, and if that's something that somebody wants to take on, they could start now. Um, we could give you access. I should be clear, we also will give access to our GitHub repository for those people who are on the team, so absolutely. If there's somebody who wants to take on that project and start playing with it, that'd be fantastic. Great, um, looks like Henning asked about, is there documentation that describes how to set up the agents? And I saw you actually did a very extensive documentation, so maybe you could talk a little bit about how that was made, what goes into it, and maybe what's your process for keeping that uh, live? Sure, so this is um, our CMOC PRD, our product requirements document. This has been developed for three years, and this is the phase B version as of one month ago today. And this is available on the website for free. We have another version internal that's about the same thing, just a few more notes and such. Um, so this document is very extensive. This has a description of every single agent all the processes. It has footnotes for every piece of every resource that we have, all the research diagrams. Here's the human agent. Um, this is all the data that the human agent is built upon. And here's the um, oxygen thresholds, the CO2 thresholds. This is the definition of all the ECLIS agents. Each and every each ECLIS agent has been validated by Paragon Space Development Corporation, which just oh, two months ago landed the contract with NASA to do the life support system for the Artemis mission. Um, so we work very closely with them. Uh, a couple of their uh, aerospace engineers are on our team and help us develop this. 
And so you can see this just goes on and on and on. Here's all the plants. Here's a description of plants, the structures, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the background data. And then this is the agent, um, the agent description file. And this is a single JSON file that stores all of the agents. So those two files together, this is all of the data that is then uh, described in this single file. This file is loaded at the point of launching the server and becomes the, the foundation for all the interactions. Sorry, that was a little long-winded, I apologize, but that's, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, uh, I think kind of, you mentioned Paragon. Um, maybe another question is, are there any partnerships that you have for example, with NASA or other research institutions that would try and use this simulation to design the first human missions to Mars? And then if not, what would be required to productize it for real missions? Okay, that's a really good segue. Thank you. You, uh, you brought me into what would be the last slide. So first I want to, uh, to show the partners that we do have. This project started at Arizona State University. Uh, is currently working in tight collaboration with the Biosphere 2 and the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences at your University of Arizona. Uh, controlled Environmental Agricultural Center called SEAC is an advanced research center in plant physiology. They've been doing closed ecosystem studies for many, many years, for 20 or 30 years. Uh, we work with the Arizona Science Center for the interactive components, Paragon. And although I have to be careful, NASA has not given us funding, so I can't call them a partner, uh, but we do have individuals at NASA Johnson Space Center and Kennedy who have contributed an incredible amount to the success of this, and of course, National Geographic, as I described. Um, so let me go back to answer your prior question. We've been working for over a year on the development of the world's highest fidelity Mars analog and research station. This is not a simulation, this is the real thing. This will be a prototype of what we're actually gonna build on Mars. Not necessarily architecturally, but in terms of function. So this is a 3D model that we printed of our design and I took it to the biosphere and photographed it in the front yard. And uh, we have uh, inch and a high astronauts. <laughs> and uh, so this, this greenhouse, of course, is not architecturally what we would see on Mars, but this is an existing structure that was used in the 1980s while they were building the real biosphere. There were three women who consecutively lived in this for up to a month at a time, completely sealed from the outside world, living entirely from the plants that were growing inside, both for their atmospheric um, recycling and for the water and for the waste products and food. So this CMOC and Sam, this is called SAM, and these two together are a, a, a system. So CMOC gives us a mathematical and computational engine to simulate these complex behaviors. We're going to keep working on the high fidelity of the fidelity of CMOC, giving it more interactions, more agents, closer approximations, uh, fine tuning those mathematical relationships to get as close as possible. But ultimately, we have to tie CMOC into the real thing, into something that's real. So we're going to remove the simulation function of CMOC and tie it directly into live data output from sensors, from hundreds of sensors inside of this, this actual uh, habitat that we're going to station at the biosphere too. So now CMOC will become, will be learning from the data that's being generated by this, this research station. And then we rebuild the database and all of the JSON files and the functionality of CMOC based upon the real data. And that's where the artificial intelligence comes in. Once we get those two interlocked, CMOC becomes a learning tool and a control tool in which we can then do positive feedback into the environment through the reinforcement learning and take control of SAM from the simulation engine itself. That's our long-term goal. We're currently in the fundraising uh, for, for SAM and for this, uh, this analog. That is really cool to hear that it could eventually be used for a direct control. Um, we have some more questions coming in. One is, uh, have you ever considered modeling emergencies such as rapid depressurization or radiation events that could damage the uh, environmental control and life support system? Yeah, I'll start with that and then I'll hand it off to Ezio if he has some, some more ideas and feedback. Um, and I apologize, as you can see, it's, it's getting dark here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm disappearing in the view. Um, 
So in the original version of CMOC three years ago when we started working on it, it was more of a game design back then. And that was actually one of the first things we wanted to do was simulate entropy. We, we actually have built into the underlying structure of CMOC, although not active now, what we call an entropy engine, which is a knob that you can turn that increases or decreases the stochastic behavior of the model. So that's actually there in the underlying code. We haven't integrated it or activated it yet. The long-term goal will be once we get the fidelity to its nominal level. And again, CMOC is a research tool first and foremost, and then an educational tool. And eventually we'd like to add some of those stochastic behaviors so that we have things like micrometeorites smashing a greenhouse and every, everything dying in one greenhouse or a airlock seal breaking or a compressor motor dying. Once we're able to integrate those things, then we've got something really, really interesting. But we've got to make certain before we start making it game-like, we've got to make certain that the underlying research tool is functional and has uh, has been demonstrated in the real world. And as you know, anything you'd like to add to that from a from a programming standpoint, or no, I think you answered the question. Okay. Another one is um, so if I wanted to adjust the simulation to some of our own systems, those are the files we'd have to modify. Mm, Ezio, good one for you. Yeah, so the port uh, behavior of the agents uh, is uh, uh, defined by the JSON file that I showed uh, before, uh, even though it wasn't really clear. But uh, basically, the, we have this uh, JSON file that describes each individual agent with all the inputs, all the outputs, all the function. So just by editing that JSON file, uh, you can add uh, a new agent or uh, change the behavior or define um, your own agents. So if you have a system uh, and uh, you find the, um, which are the agents in your system and how they are connected with each other, then um, you can uh, edit this JSON file to uh, basically create the agent that uh, model your system. And then you can use CMOC to, to run it. Does that answer your question? Look, looks like it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, another uh, question from Molly is, um, has CMOC been, you, maybe you could speak to how it's been used for educational purposes, uh, and maybe what you see as the vision for that. Sure. Um, in, it, because we just launched one month ago, we haven't, and, and schools just letting out, uh, we haven't had an opportunity for CMARC to be incorporated into a, num a large number of classrooms. However, in October of last year, and then again in May of this year, April and May timeframe, um, National Geographic has a board or a panel of professional educators. It's called their Education Review uh, panel, and they actually preview and use all of the software before it goes live on the National Geographic website. And these people are certified with Nat Geo. So we had two different experiences where we gave CMOC to those teachers and said, hey, go run with it. And in October, it was a lot of things breaking, server going down, typical things that happen to new software. However, in the last round, we got some really positive feedback. And if you go to the CMOC website, there's both an example of a curriculum that one of the teachers built for her eighth grade class, or was it, I think, sixth grade class, where she took our next generation science Align, next generation science standard curriculum and integrate it into her own uh, interactive uh, curriculum for her classroom. And then she did video interviews with the kids. It, it's fun. It's super, super fun to see what they came up with. So that's our first experience. We have two or three other teachers who have done something similar. And we're looking forward to getting a lot more feedback, especially next fall when the classes kick in again to see how CMOC is used in the classroom. Great. Well, if uh, anyone doesn't have any other questions, one maybe last question. I know you kind of left us with a teaser of uh, homework to check out uh, CMOC and look at that kind of unexpected finding. I'm wondering if you could talk about any other unexpected or surprising findings that maybe uh, went counter to your uh, intuition, um, but you learned about uh, through this simulation. Yeah, that's that's really thank you. That's a good question. Um, I think I'll start with with having developed software, been on software development teams over the years. I find that even though we designed the software and we know what's happening inside, to see emergent behavior 
in something that we developed, but we don't always understand what the emergent behavior is. And we have to go diving in deep to investigate within our own model. That tells me that we succeeded. And we do, we find ourselves doing that a lot. I often build spreadsheet models to, to match the functionality of what's happening CMOC point to point to make certain that's working properly. And so one of the things that came out of it that, that really taught me a lesson is that we think often about things as being unidirectional. We think, well, I need oxygen from the plants, but we forget that the plants need carbon dioxide from us. And I know it sounds relatively simple, but I remember the first time that I couldn't understand why the plants were dying. Well, it turned out the plants were dying because there weren't enough humans. But we don't think of it that way. We think of it as, well, we need enough plants to su support the humans. We also need enough humans to support the plants. And I know it sounds simple, but it, that kind of interactive and interreliance behavior is what makes it so fascinating to run this model. And that's where you start to get this chaotic behavior where you'll see plants not growing. You'll see them stalling or stagnating or not reaching their full potential biomass within their given growth period because they're simply not getting enough light because you didn't put enough solar panels or they're not getting enough carbon dioxide because you don't have enough humans or you have too many plants for the given space. And that's the kind of interrelationship that gets really complex and really fun um, to see how it works. Right. Well, I think this has been absolutely uh, fascinating and as evidenced by a hundred percent clap emoji, <laughs> um, I think uh, everyone else thought so as well. So thank you again so much uh, for sharing with this, uh, this with us. And I hope that you know, members of our community will get in touch with you about perhaps how they could contribute. And thank you so much for taking time to, to attend.